those. The following interview was conducted with James C. Blackmore, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Clinical Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, August 20th, 2009 at his residence in West Lafayette. Good afternoon, Dr. Blakemore, and welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you. You're welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born in Michigan, uh, actually in the Flint area. At that time, it was a very busy place, heavily industrialized. In fact, at one point, we lived on Chevrolet Avenue, which was not very far from the Chevrolet factory, and as a kid, I got real excited about seeing all those cars and trucks driving off the line day after day after day. That's kind of neat. Uh, it is neat. Sure. Uh, uh, actually, I was born in 1932, so those were depression years, and it was uh, um, sometimes difficult and sometimes not, uh, but everybody was under the same circumstances, and so... Was uh, your, did, your, did your father get... Was he able to continue his employment? He was, but it was interesting that... He, he got a letter from the management saying that he would, would stay on, but his pay would be reduced uh, uh, significantly at, at the time. And uh, I remember clearly that during that particular time, it was a big deal to have Spanish rice with, uh, for your meals. Uh, my folks did whatever they could to sure. make it work. And I can remember, too, as a kid, that um, milk came by horse-drawn wagon delivery. And so hearing the milk bottles clink was a very real thing. And uh, ice came on a horse-drawn wagon. And uh, that was pretty neat, all of that, because the wagon would stop and the delivery person would get off and they'd whistle at the horse to move on to the, to the next spot, uh, which was really neat. But in the summertime, when the guy brought ice, uh, he would knock off a little chunk and hand it to us. So that was even better than getting ice cream cones. Right. <laughs> there was nothing like a little ice there. There you go. It was. Sure. And then, and then uh, came the the war years, of course, uh, the first, the Second World War. And during that particular time, where my dad worked, was making aircraft engines, and he worked. Uh, pretty much day and night because he was a tool specialist and whenever they would have something break he'd have to rig up a, a substitute or a repair to keep production going. Was he working for one of the auto companies? or He worked for Buick. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was that close to pretty much where you lived or the No, plant? that that was uh, when we lived on Chevrolet Avenue. The Buick factory was also in Flint and he worked at the, at the Buick plant. Sure. Okay. Uh, and I can remember too clearly that during the war years, uh, well, I was, you know, getting to be a teenager at that point, and um, the paper drives, scrap drives, and things like that were were a big deal. Uh, right. I can remember still being in Boy Scouts, we'd be on a huge big truck, and we'd drive around town, and there'd be people with their paper stacked out by the road, you'd and pick, pick it them up, up and throw them on the truck and haul it in, and, and this was with big, you know, flatbed trucks we were gathering these things so people were very much involved and sure. and uh, the spirit was was remarkable and I can remember listening to the radio for the war news and how exciting it was when when all of that came to an end did they did any of your people have uh, or the community have victory gardens oh yes in fact my folks had a, had a garden out uh, somewhere outside of town there was a huge area where you could have a plot of of land, I know where it was, but it was it was outside of town, sure. and so that, uh, in fact, introduced my folks to an area outside of the city, and that little town is Flushing, and so when I was in high school, we moved to to Flushing, and I went to high school there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I was all of this time I was very much interested in being a veterinarian. Did you have any brothers, any siblings? Or? I have a brother who lives now in New Mexico uh -huh. and a sister who lives up in Traverse City, Michigan. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about high school then, how large a school? Well, high Flushing be? was a little school where I suppose there were 40 of us in a class, maybe something like that. And I, and when I moved there, I was 10th grade and uh, got acquainted with the kids and got interested in government. and so. I was in student council and 
served as president of student council senior year Good. and got really well acquainted with a lot of kids and and I also uh, took a tape recorder to the basketball games and recorded basketball games and took them back and then played them at school uh, I wasn't big enough to be an athlete but well, I was that's big. kind of a nice addition though well it was we would tape record the games and then take them back and then play them over the lunch hour in, in the cafeteria so it was it was a neat school, sure. and uh, there I was very much involved in uh, uh, FFA and the ag program and that sort of thing because of my interest in veterinary medicine, and then I got a part time job as the veterinarian with with the veterinarian in town, and so after school I would go clean cages or do whatever it was that needed to be done around his place. Was I, I mean, it sounds like he was a small animal practice. No, 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 at that time oh. it, was, it was basically a veterinarian oh. as a veterinarian, and oh. he so did. he would do farm calls and- Large he, and small. Large and small, right. Sure. And, and at that time the anesthesia was uh, ether, and so they would put a cone, or he would have me help him, and we'd put a cone over the animal's nose and then drip ether on, and and then they would go to sleep and, and you could smell the ether everywhere. I mean, it was very unsafe. And there was a- Because you would get inhaler too. Well, and there was a space heater and, and <laughs> ether is explosive, but, but that's how things were done. Sure. You know, you, you, it, that was much more humane than the way things had been up to that time. That's right. Um, during, you know, during the war, let me ask you, did you have, you had um, stamps Food sta uh, stamps yes, I, I still yes. have I still have food stamps, and I have I have my ration book uh, somewhere here in the house. Sure. Uh, and there's still some food stamps in there, and also there's a little coin dispenser because they also made little plastic coins. So some of the things were you could use coins as well. These as are stamps. for currency, though. You use the plastic well, for coins. food. For, for food. food. Oh, there so were there coins were, as well as stamps. The, well, the red coins were for meat, like the stamps. Okay. And the blue ones were for sugar and vegetables and things like that. Okay. Uh, so, oh yeah, I've still got that coupon. And then book. you had to have gas. There was the rationing. There was gas, gas rationing. Being right. at, at in war work, my dad had an A sticker so that he was able to get enough gas to get back and forth to work. But it was very limited and rubber was extremely limited. Right. So you didn't do much traveling around at the time. And the clothes didn't hand those shoes for uh, rather quickly too, if I recall. Well, the, the yeah, you just- construction was pretty poor on them. You, you were very protective of all that sort That's of thing. Right. right. <laughs> right. Oh, well then tell us after, what year did you graduate from high school and then what came next? I graduated from high school in 1950. Okay. And at that time the Korean War had started and some of my friends were off to the service early on. Uh, but I had received a scholarship to go to Michigan State, and so I did go to Michigan State for pre-vet, and things were going along very well, uh, and I was in fact accepted into veterinary school to start in 52, but the same week that I was at home, and the same week that the letter came accepting me to vet school, also came a letter from the draft board saying, greetings. Uh, you are invited to participate. And so uh, I debated about this for a while because I could have gotten a deferment. But the truth of the matter is I was pretty broke and had been working two part-time jobs at Michigan State, one as a theater usher and one in the drugstore as a soda jerk and cleanup boy and whatever else they sure. needed doing. And so uh, I decided that since the GI Bill was, was within reach uh, that I would go ahead and accept the draft notice. And so I was drafted in 1952 into the Army in the summer. And I went to Fort Custer in Michigan. Uh, and at, because of two years of college, they kept me there for a couple of months helping to, uh, or to bring in new inductees. And my job was to interview inductees and Work, look up in a book and try to determine what would be their military uh, occupation code called MOS, Military Occupational Specialty. And so that was my job is to, to interview them and look it up in the book and decide on what code was appropriate. And I was, so I was there for sure, a couple of months yeah. and that allowed me to go home uh, weekends and things like that. And 
was on one of those weekends that I met my wife at the drive-in she worked at. And so later, <laughs> after I got oh, out of the Army, why, <laughs> then, then we got back together. Sure. Uh, so I was at Fort Custer, and they, because of working there, they allowed us to choose where we would go to basic training. And I chose to go to signal school, figuring signal corps, figuring that would be a good, safe option. And so we went to uh, Camp Gordon, which is now Fort Gordon in Georgia, Augusta, Georgia. And it was nothing like the Augusta golf, golf course, I can tell you. Uh, oh, sure. Basic, basic, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> basic training is a very different uh, experience. So I was there then for basic training. And then when that got finished, uh, they sent me to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, which is just near the Jersey Shore, uh, to radio school. And so I learned to be a radio repairman there. And that was a great experience, too, because we were just outside of New York City, and we could hop a train in there sure. on the weekends, and we could go to the Jersey Shore. So military life, military life was not difficult at all. Not a hardship post. Right, it was not. And then um, in the summer of, by then it was 53, and I was uh, shipped overseas, but the time I was shipped overseas, I was on a ship to Germany at the time the war in Korea ended. So I was very fortunate to have missed all that in, in North Korea. Did they, were you going to be stationed in Germany? Is that why you were going there? Or? No. Oh, it was just supposedly no. on the way? No, no, no. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. When I finished radio school, they assigned right. me to Germany. Oh, I see. Okay. So uh, in the summer of 53, uh, I went to uh, New York to the port of embarkation, and they put us on a Liberty ship. And my wife still regrets all this because... Were you married by that time? No, oh, no, okay. we were not. But the Liberty ship uh, was, well, it was a converted for freighter was what it was. And so the bunks were stunk, stuck in there so that we were only maybe 18 inches apart, one after another on top of the other. And it was, we were packed in, everybody was seasick. This, those, those little ships were going up and down. We left New York Harbor. The Queen Mary passed us coming in. Partway out in the ocean, the Queen Mary went by us, and before we got to Europe, the Queen Mary was back on her way back to New York again. So we were on that ship a long time, sick of the whole thing. <coughs> and, and that so, you do not forget. Well, and that's why my wife's unhappy about this, because I will not go on a cruise. <laughs> I just was will it, not. That's it, you know. Well, coming back was the same experience. So between those two, I've had my fill of... of ocean-going ships. <laughs> so, so then we wound up at Bremerhaven, Germany, and I was put on a train to Bavaria, and there I was assigned to a little unit, uh, which was the 348 Ordnance and Ballistics Technical Service Detachment. And that was just a little group of about 14 of us, and our job was to inspect artillery pieces to make sure they were field-worthy. And also at times we would go out and they would fire them over uh, our photoelectric cell setup and we could then establish muscle velocity so that we could tell them what calculation, what numbers to put into their calculations for arming those big guns. So that was my assignment in Germany. But as part of that, uh, I was actually given the, or I was, well, I was in charge of the vehicles, but I was, I was put in a Jeep and sent to various army bases in Germany. And I would take a caliper and put it down the muzzle and flip it over and then I could get the exact muzzle measurement and then record that so that they had that. So that was a routine thing to go check the artillery pieces. So that was my Great job. Great experience. It, it, it was wonderful <laughs> because I was traveling through southern Germany by myself, and that's and nobody else in the jeep, just no, you, just oh. me, and, and that's where I, and I learned German very quickly, because I had to ask directions, I had to ask where's the bathroom, where's the restaurant, you can't look it up in your where's the autobahn, no, well you could at first, but that got tiresome. So in the year I was in in Germany, it was a really a great experience. I would say so. And. and at that time, it was not too long after the war, so there were still large rubble piles around. But people were warming to our presence, and uh, 
we were on just, I was on a little tiny post outside of Nurman, Nurman, Nuremberg. And that had been a German fighter base to protect Nuremberg, but now we were stationed in there with a few other small units. And nearby was a town called Bad Winsheim, which means it's a baths were there. And so uh, I remember going into town and there'd be the, the old city hall tower, the Rathaus tower, and you would pull on a wire and a lady would look, an old lady would look down and you would holler up Schlüssel bitte, which means key please. And she would take this big iron key and throw it down and it would bounce a few times and then you could open the door, climb the stairs to the tower and then you could uh, look out over the city. So I have some nice pictures of the rooftops of Bad Winsheim. Super. And we were also not far from Rotenburg, which is uh, the, about the only walled city that was really survived the war very well. And we had adopted an orphanage there, so we were going to The Rotenburg. U.S. had adopted this orphanage? Well, our, our particular base oh, had. Oh, okay. So I can remember we would you know, get them geese at holidays and things like that. Sure. So all in all, that turned out to be a really great experience. Right. And then I came out of that with the GI Bill on top of that. So okay. I, I actually yep. was very lucky. I won the lottery on, on the draft. I think you did, right. Okay. I really did. Yeah. So, so then, that, then I was discharged in 54 and uh, went to work in the uh, automobile factory in, in, in there in Flint. And Jeannie and I got married that winter because in order, to, and I had reapplied to get into vet school. Because you hadn't finished it then. Oh, you no, I hadn't even gotten into vet school. I, 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 had, I had been admitted. Oh. I finished pre-vet. I had been admitted, but then I didn't oh. actually start vet school. Right. So that place went to somebody else. So then uh, we found out that in order to to live in married housing, you had to file very early. So we married in, in December of 1954. And then it was in the spring of 55 that I was accepted back into school. And uh, then we went to East Lansing in 1955. Okay. So then that's when uh, I started uh, vet school. And the day that vet school started was the day our son was born. So now there were the three of us to go to vet school, and we did. We lived in married student housing, and that had recently been barracks for military. During the war. Right, like our the war. permanent temporary. Like very temporary. <laughs> in fact, after we graduated, they tore them down. They were uh, done with them. Not as long as ours were. <laughs> no. So those, those were torn down, but it was, it was great housing for us. We were in the barracks at the end department, and I had 200 feet of fence up around the end of the building for a yard for our son. So it was wonderful living it's a nice conditions. Hit. The end is always pretty good. I right. think, it was great. Know. Yeah. It, it, it was, was it was it close to campus too? Yes, it was okay. within walking distance. Uh huh. And, and it had a space heater, an oil heater, and the walls got icy in the winter. But who cares? Yeah. And it, it was very inexpensive. We could afford it. The GI Bill kept things very much. Uh, workable for us. Jeannie worked uh, uh, part-time, worked full-time some of the time until our son got to the point where she didn't want to leave him with somebody sure, else. Right. What sort of work, where did, what sort of work was she doing? Well, she was doing working, clerking at Sears. Okay, that's uh -huh. good. I like retailing. I've and, done that myself. You and, get a great discount. Right, <laughs> and, and then and then she started uh, a daycare program and had had some of the neighbor's kids for a good share of the time before we graduated. Oh, that's good. So then I graduated in 1959. Okay. And I was wanting to go into private practice in Michigan, but uh, I was offered an internship at uh, University of California, Davis. And internships are a very interesting sort of uh, development because it was very new to our profession to have internships and things like that. Uh, it was either grad student or internship. and. Uh, I kind of wanted to do that, so I spent a year in the clinics at the University of California, Davis, in their vet school, which was a very new school. They'd only been in existence four or five years. So there the staff was very small. Uh, I was, uh, in fact, I, I became 
as an intern, I became advisor to the student chapter of the American Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, uh, so it was a neat experience there, too. Did your wife and ch child go out there with you? They, oh, yeah, we were there. Uh, and our second son was born while we were there in California. Okay, yeah. And we got to do a fair amount of exploring on weekends and things like that. That's, so. I think that campus has probably grown over the years, but it is a pretty large campus. Well, uh, at that time, it was very tiny. Oh. There was no med school. There was no engineering school. There was... There was just a little... But a, the vet school was there, though. The vet school had there. just been built there. Oh, okay. And that was about... It was, it was a very small campus. Uh, in fact, when we got to... We drove to California, and when we got there and drove into Davis, uh, we thought that was a little strip mall for a bigger city. But it wasn't. That was Davis. <laughs> <laughs> that was downtown Davis. <laughs> so it was very tiny at that time. Oh, uh. Then what came next after that? Well, then after that, uh, we moved back to Bay City, Michigan to work in the practice that I had been going to work in. Before and, you went out to California? Right, and Bay, Bay City is right at the mouth of the Saginaw Bay uh, in the lower part of Michigan. And so I went to work there, and it was, a again, a small practice with one person, and he did everything there was to do. And so the clinic was a two-car garage, and half of it was still garage. People would walk up to the front to the waiting room, and, uh, and half of that front was, way, it was for them to sit, or a little piece was for sitting, and the rest was our exam room. And so if I were doing a summer trim on a dog and saw somebody drive in, I would quickly put the dog in the cage, clean up the room, and then be ready to, to greet this person to see what they... <laughs> what they needed for us to do. you got some great experience. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> and and uh, he had established the practice and had lived there quite a long time. And he wanted to get away from living so close, so we moved into the house on the grounds. Oh, you did? Was, we did. And uh -huh. it was a big old farmhouse, and they had people living on the second floor also. So it was a big old farmhouse, and we lived on the first floor, and the clinic was out here beside the beside the building. And uh, I remember one night, a car came tearing down the road, brakes screeching, and a guy came in. I looked out, and the dust was swirling in his headlights. And he came to the door, and I asked him what I could do. And he said, well, my dog's not well. Can you see it? And I said, well, sure. Uh, meet me out there at the clinic. And he said, well, i got to go get it. So I went out to the clinic, and he got in the car, slammed the door shut, and roared out the driveway. Hours later, I never saw him again. Hmm. He just, he didn't come back. I don't know whether the animal had died or what had happened, but he just, he never did get back. But that was the kind of thing that would happen in, a, in that sort of setting. Sure. And then there was another day that, uh, uh, and mind you now, I had been two, hours in, two years in the Army, uh, all through vet school, a couple years in the, fa or a year in the factory, a year in an internship. And so uh, one morning, a guy, pulled up early and my wife answered the door and he said he had run over his dog with his bicycle could we check it so she said sure take it out there and my husband will be out in a minute well I got dressed and ready and I went out and I let him in I examined the animal it seemed fine I said well let's let's us keep it through the morning and make sure there's not something we're not seeing and uh, so he said okay so he left it well, a couple hours later, the guy that owned the place was a big old tall, very acerbic red-haired guy, and he walked in, he says, ha ha, big doc, he says, tell me what's going on. And I said, what's the matter? He said, well, we got a complaint about you. And I said, what's that? What, what's happened? He said, well, did you take in a dog hurt by a bicycle this morning? And I said, well, yes, I did. You want to have a look? He said, well, he said, the guy called the Humane Society and complained that I was sending my kid out to check emergencies. Hmm. <laughs> so they thought that I was the owner's kid checking the dog. <laughs> well, my Lord. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. But that's the kind of thing that happens in a little environment in a small like that. Thing. That's right. Oh, yeah. And then... Uh, we also, at that time, the state of Michigan was doing tuberculosis testing. And so we uh, had a 
by an area in Michigan for humans a little and bit animals as for, well? for cattle. Oh, okay. For cattle. And so we were testing cattle up a ways from what was around Midland, Michigan. And most of the people there worked for Dow in the factories sure. and and they had gentleman farmer type things where there'd be a few head of cattle in a in a pen and that's about it. Well this was the dead of winter, this was like February or so. We went to this I I, I, I he didn't go with me, I was by myself. No, I'm sorry, we were together. And we stopped and here was this bunch of Angus cattle about oh, almost up to my shoulders, I suppose, in a pen outdoors, with no, no barn, and, and there was a heater in the water tank. And here were these cattle just loose. And tuberculin testing, you raise the tail and you inject a little tuberculin in the tail fold and you come back two days later to see if there's been a reaction to the tuberculin. Well, imagine an un, uh, basically not housebroken Angus calf that tall, that big, and you're trying to raise the tail. So what we finally had to do was head them into the corner and while they were struggling with each other, raise the tail and get it injected. <laughs> and it was so cold that you'd get the tail up and the tuberculin would be frozen. Then you'd have to stop and thaw the tuberculin get the cattle back in position and then get the Try it again, cattle. right. Oh. You know? <laughs> so that, that was, it was that kind thing. Of interesting. But, but like with, with uh, all creatures great and small, I can remember being in a, in a fantastically beautiful dairy barn. There were some, around Frankenmuth area in Michigan, there's some big old German farms and the dairy farms were wonderfully clean and nice. And so, in a cold winter's day, you go into the dairy barn and it'd be warm and sweet smelling and, and it was wonderful. In fact, I would lean against the cow to listen to her heart rather than <laughs> put on the stethoscope. So that was a delightful sure. se setting. Yeah. And there were times you had to pull a calf and, and in some of those little barns, you were laying flat on the floor with your arm up the cow laying on her side and were struggling to get the calf in position. Sure. And I can remember one experience that my grandchildren think is so fabulous, and that is I had my hand in the cow's rectum, but that's not a very thick-walled organ, the colon, and the calf had its fingers, or its mouth, around with the uterus pushed over this and now sucking on my fingers. So <laughs> before it was ever born, that calf was was suckling on my fingers, oh, and that was That's that was, nice. was a great experience. Yeah, it's a nice thing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh. So those are the kinds of things that happened in that practice in Michigan, and I had no inclination that I wouldn't just stay in Michigan. But at about that time, Dean Morse had been appointed to come here uh, to start the vet school, and I had worked for him as a student at Michigan State. He had guinea pigs for his research and I was the guy raising guinea pigs. And we had hundreds, hundreds of guinea pigs. And so uh, that had all gone very well, obviously. And so one day a phone rang and he asked me if I was interested in interviewing for a position here at Purdue. And man, I had been praying actually for something other than spending the rest of my life uh, with people thinking I was the owner's kid or or doing some of the things that it required. That you've been doing. Uh-huh, yeah. right. And I was, I was only earning, well, uh, what I was earning was our housing and $100 a week. That was it, that was our pay. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was very interested in any other offers at the time. Sure. And so we came here in, in the winter of, let's see, California, back to Michigan in 60, so it was in 61 in the winter that we came here to interview and uh, they offered me a position. And so uh, we took the job, obviously. And so the summer of 61, then we moved to, to West Lafayette. What, where did you live when you first came here? We lived on Happy Hollow Road, okay. uh, across from what was the West Lafayette Water Company at the time. Oh, those Catherwood would be Cather the Catherwood State. Yeah, where Catherwood is now, where where PR of housing, the houses yes, were down yeah, there. Sure. The university owned the houses and, right. and had them available for for people moving here until they got located and settled and all. 
So yes, we lived in a house. That was one, a handy. That's a handy location. Well, it was yeah. a wonderful sure. location. We were very happy with it. Yeah. Um, and at that time, <clears throat> when I came here, uh, there were that made three of us in the small animal clinic. That was uh, John. Oh, why is why is this missing? It'll come back. Uh, anyway, there were three of us. And there was a guy that was brought here to start the small animal clinic, Andy Lavignette, who was, came after him, and then me. So there were the three of us. And uh, Annis, John Annis. So it was John Annis and uh, Andy Lavignette and me. That was it. That was the three the and faculty. And of course, Lynn Hall had been had been dedicated already in 1960, correct? So that right, was, that had been dedicated. Right. The school, the classes had been started. So the first class was in their second year, and in the fall of '61, they were to start their third year of vet school, okay. which is when the clinical training started. So when we arrived here in July, there were no students in the clinics. Uh, there were just a few patients because we were trying to get a practice going to teach students with. Sure. Uh, the place was virtually empty. We were still unpacking equipment, stocking shelves, and, and developing procedures, uh, planning courses, and that sort of thing. And then, and then we opened the doors to the clinic. People started bringing their animals in. So it was it was open to the community as well as the university. It was open to Always the clinic worked. from the very be, from the, mm -hmm. to the public from the very beginning. Okay. And in fact, we encouraged that because we wanted our students to see what things are really like with primary care. Right. And at that time, secondary care was not a very big issue to tell you the truth. It was more like we were going to train students to be private practitioners, and nobody was thinking interns, residents, specialties, and that sort of thing. There weren't any specialists. And so there were the three of us, and each week, uh, well, each day, we would take turns with the next case in. And so case might walk in the door that needed vaccinating. The next one coming in might have diarrhea. Next one through the door might be scratching. Next one may have a broken leg. Uh, so. It just we just took them as generalists okay. one after the other sure. in order, and this went on for the first couple of years actually. And the students were in the. And then did you find each. Well, we got students, students in in the summer, of uh, in, I'm sorry, in the late summer of '61 or in the um, no. Then we weren't doing summer clinics, so it was in the fall of '61. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we had the summer, uh, July and August to get, and some of September to get the practice actually going to the point where we could accommodate students. Right. And uh, with all that going on, we took turns taking emergency duty. So along with everything else, every third week, we had emergency duty. And that meant uh, nights, weekends, whenever there was a call, uh, you took it along with whatever else sure. you were doing. Right. Uh, and we had one woman who was the receptionist, but she also kept the records, made the appointments, kept the books, cleaned up the front room if it needed cleaning between cases. Uh, so she was do everything person. And in the back there was one man who cleaned kennels, held animals for us, and helped to stock shelves or whatever need doing. And that was it, the three of us and those two people. Having, having taken my cats there, I know the small animal, you know, I've been there. It was, that's a, it's a lot different today. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's so different. I, I'll tell you, I, I couldn't have imagined then what it would be like now. In our dreams, we believed it would grow, but it seemed to be growing so slowly in those early years, you know, because there were the three of us and we were developing the courses, and then we wanted to get a referral practice going, so we spent a lot of time going to meetings around the state where the veterinarians were meeting in their locality to give talks, to get acquainted, and invite them to refer cases here. So then things started to come to us on referral. And as that happened, then there were some things that occurred in greater numbers than others. And one of those was broken bones and joints, and so John Annis started specializing just 
not as a learned specialist, but as a, a, a need to take care of those. Andy was interested in eyes, so he took those cases, and I was interested in skin disorders and that sort of thing, and so I took those. And then we took everything else besides, of course, but sure, yeah. we tried to kind of develop some, some expertise. Some sort of especially so they, they could help if there were some special things. Right, so we could do better for those cases than... That required that. Right. And so then after a few years of that, we were able to get funding for an intern. And so he came and he was our, he was working with us and then he st we got funding, when he finished up, we got funding to have him stay on as a sort of an adjunct, not really a for permanent person, but to stay on. So now there were four of us. And then over the years, uh, we gradually were able to add other individuals. And then, of course, uh, internships became a, rea a reality. So you basically, if you were going to call yourself a vet school, had to offer internships. And then in the 60s, we began to develop residencies, which was still more advanced training. And an internship would be one year. And they were sort of a rotating internship through all of the services we offered, whether medical or surgical or whatever. Um, and then we got to the point where we could offer residencies, which is to keep somebody for two or three years and let them work toward a graduate degree or at least specialty training and train to take the board exams for that specialty. But I can tell you that during the time that there were the three or four of us I can remember I was teaching surgery, and nowadays I, I would I would shudder at this, but I can remember I was I, I was teaching one of the surgery courses, uh, and we had surgery labs, and I had kids in lab doing surgeries, and somebody came to me and said, "There's an animal downstairs that we were doing an insecticidal dip on, and it's seizuring. You got to come." And so I would leave the lab to go down and, and help with the seizuring dog and have somebody from the lab come and get me if there was something real bad going on. Otherwise, get back and do there as quickly as I could oh, wow. to, to manage the lab, to manage the lab. That's kind of a real, real busy. It, we were really, really, really busy yeah. uh, during those early years. Yeah, getting things off the ground and, mm -hmm. you know, try, and I, I think your point that you made is good, getting the word out to the state at the same time mm -hmm. that you were doing, getting the thing up and running here. Mm -hmm. And that's, you gotta, it's a balancing act. Well, and at that but time, you have to do it. There were no Purdue grads. No. At that time, they were all either Michigan State grads or Ohio State grads sure. or Illinois yeah. grads that were practicing in the state. So right. they had already established a tendency if they were going to consult with somebody on the phone or perhaps refer a case that it would be to those to one of those, right, where they mm -hmm. came from, where mm -hmm. they got their degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. And referring patients was still not all that much of a, an activity. So it was sort of, you know, a big deal to, to have somebody referred to, to us with, with a patient. Yeah. And then, then as part of that, uh, we started the internal medicine specialty. So I was a charter member of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, uh, helping get that going. And then dermatology, at that time, we were part of that college. But as we developed our numbers and our skills and our abilities, uh, and that was around the time I became an adjunct professor in the Durham department at IU to help learn some things that I could make use of and also to share things with them, particularly about disorders transmissible between animals and people, skin disorders. So there was, there was some interchange there, but I was learning a lot from those people, which it had to happen. Sure. And, and so then we developed our dermatology specialty, and I was the person who represented our specialty to the boards in Chicago to get our specialty approved and recognized and then we put together all the things we had to put together to become recognized as a specialty. And the hoops were pretty big. A constitution, uh, rules and regulations, exam, that they would, that they would right. consider reasonable and appropriate. Sure. And then we were, on, we were finally established in 64 or so. 
and then uh, we eventually got approved and the American College of Veterinary Dermatology became a specialty. And so I was uh, early in the officers of that and that sort of thing. Served as president a time or two, I guess. So it's nice to see things like that come to fruition, isn't it? Well, it is. It's wonderful. With that, all the work. That but that, that is the neatest part of it all, is to see things form and develop and, and progress. Right. Uh, we, you, you need to see that. Hopefully you're going to see oh, it. Oh, that, that's a, a wonderful. That, that's the greatest aspect of all this, because as it stands now, I can remember kids that came here, one in particular, she came with her parents when they they brought their animal, and I saw them, and that little girl said, you know, I want to be a veterinarian. And so we talked some, and by golly, later she was admitted to the school, and now she's a faculty. Here, this yep, uh -huh. and now she's a faculty member at Cornell. Isn't that nice? And then there's another family that came here. Uh, uh, they brought their little Boston Terrier and the little yet red-haired girl showed me how she would pour coke in her hand and the dog would drink from her hand. And that's Barbara Sparby, who is a uh, West Lafayette City Council person. Or she was, she's not now. Right. But she was. That's uh, um, Be Bev Burwell's daughter. Burwell's, right, the Burwell's. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Jim and Bev Burwell. Right, so I've, I've known them ever since she was just a little girl with a puppy. <laughs> and th that is so neat that as, is as nice. a part of this to be yeah. involved in that. That is nice, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, yeah. and there have been other kids, of course, along the way. This, like this fall conference, we've got people coming to speak who were um, interns here or residents here or graduates of this school uh, who are now coming back as uh, qualified experts and speakers. And that is so, so neat nice. to see that it, take It's place. very special. It is. Yeah. It, there's nothing like it. That's right, exactly. Nothing, just nothing like that. Yeah. Um, you, so you've talked a little bit about your research. Talk a little, make some comment on the um, the pet allergies, and that'll lead into the derm. That's part of the dermatology. And then that that you, is we're, that is. Uh, right. let, let me backtrack just okay. a little. Uh, Go ahead. Well, well, when we were developing all this, I was also trying to learn some. So I spent uh, a couple of weeks at the University of Miami in the dermatology department there. At their med school? In, in, no, no, med school. Med school. In the med school, because a, a fellow practitioner had a practice in Miami and we'd had him here to speak. I knew him well and he offered to put me up at his house while I was staying at the University of Miami. So I was there a couple of weeks and got to know their Durham specialist very well. And at that time the Vietnam War was on and they were, were working with developing materials for treating skin problems in Vietnam. And fungal infections were a very, very important problem in the troops because there's a, a fungal infection of rats that GIs were picking up from infested foxholes and unsanitary conditions and all that sort of thing. And the diagnostics for what people refer to as ringworm, which I, I hate that word. It's not a ring and it's not a worm, but it's that's a, the term it's, that's used. That's the term. It's a yeah. fungal infection. And uh, in fact, I used to argue with the students, those are two four-letter words that I will not accept, <laughs> ring and worm. So anyway, these, these dermatophyte infections or fungal infections, uh, to diagnose them took cultures which were lengthy and tedious to do and required microscopic work to identify. And so if you had, like in Vietnam, they had thousands of culture tubes to look at, these guys developed a way to put in a color indicator in the agar, and when a dermatophyte grows, it produces an alkaline medium, which then helps to dissect the keratin in the skin and allow penetration. And so when a dermatophyte was growing, a pathogen was growing on this agar, the color indicator phenol red would turn red, and you could see from a distance, that's a tube to follow. And so they showed me that, and I thought, you know, this is really good stuff. And so I brought it back here. We started using it. It worked for the pathogens of our cases. And so uh, that's one of the early things that I did was to adapt that for use by veterinarians and get that in, in the literature and promote its use by veterinarians. So that was an early thing and part of my learning as well as 
Yeah. Sharing. Really nice. yeah. So that was a good experience, a real good experience. Uh, then, as we went along, uh, still I was doing generalist stuff in the clinic because we were so small, and it was only in the last five years or ten, maybe five, eight, six years, six years of my career, that I was able actually to just focus on skin disorders. But over that time, it had taken more and more and more of my time. And one of the things that is a very big problem is allergies in, in dogs and in cats, but in dogs in particular. And it sounds like a simple thing, you give them an antihistamine and it's over, but in dogs it's devastating. For example, there's a high school teacher here, Kathy Nimmer, out at Harrison, who is blind, had a guide dog, and she actually had to give up her guide, using her guide dog. She would take him to school with her, he would be under her desk, but he spent so much time rubbing and scratching and digging that nobody could concentrate on anything. He couldn't work safely by getting her across the street because of his misery. He was so he uncomfortable. An allergy of some sort? He has allergies, and oh. what that does is it sets the skin up for infection, and then the combination of the allergic discomfort and the infection in the skin makes the skin get very red, very irritated, very uncomfortable. They lose hair, they get really sick from it, and they, they can do nothing. That dog couldn't function. And that's not uncommon with these allergies. Uh, it's really, de really debilitating. So w along the way, we, we developed the ability to do skin testing to determine what sorts of things they're sensitive to. And it turns out it's very much like humans. So ragweed, pollen, is very important. And in fact, that's just coming on now, middle of August, to the, and it peaks around this Labor Day. So people ask me now, you know, my dog's itching lately. And one of the first concerns is maybe that's what's going on. And it's very common in dogs. Uh, and uh, tree pollens are very important. Uh, molds are very important. And danders are very important. Um, in fact, uh, say the horse dander, cat dander, that sort of thing. Uh, and you may not want to use this, I don't know, but uh, I have a friend who used to be at the University of Pennsylvania, now long gone. Uh, and he was a crusty old guy and, and he was doing allergy testing and that sort of thing. And there was a lady came in that was really a pest to everybody until she finally convinced him to allergy test her dog. So she, he was doing the test, and she was pestering him and driving him just absolutely batty. And, oh, no, don't do that. Oh, it'll hurt. Oh, no, what's that? And she was really making him miserable. <laughs> so he got the test all done, and he looked over the results, and she said, what, 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 what do you see? He says, well, your dog is allergic to pollens and dust, husk dust and human dander. And she says, human dander? She says, oh my God, what do we do? And he says, we're going to have to put you to sleep. <laughs> I don't remember but that, that. That, that, was, that was typical of him to have remarks like that. Uh, he knew not, how to handle the situation. He, well, he, he just was ready to come back with that kind of a remark. <laughs> but it is true that uh, animals can be allergic to human dander. Uh, now, there are lots of ways to deal with these allergies, sure. and, and my concerns were besides, uh, well, we, we do give allergy shots, and most of the time, we, I would try to teach the people how to do the injecting themselves, and then they would get the materials from me, and I would provide the formula for each season. I don't know that anybody else even now does it this way, but there's a little different mixture for each season, and there's six seasons, basically. Winter, early spring, spring, summer, fall, the transition between fall and winter and winter. So altogether, there's six different time periods. And so I had devised some software to make formulas that would help us to proportion how much tree pollen to use in early spring versus how much ragweed pollen to use in this time of year and that sort of thing, so it varied. So I provided the people with the formulations and then they would get from me the individual antigens in their vials. So here would be tree pollens, here's grass pollen, here's house dust, here's uh, ragweed, etc. 
And so they would do that, and then uh, we would train them to actually do the in mixing and do the injections oh, at home. Oh, doing the mixing as well. Yes, so, they, okay. they were to use my formula and then make the mixture at the time they needed it. And then uh, they would do that, and then they would keep very detailed records for me, including a calendar that I developed for them to track it on. And then they would provide me with their records so I could see whether that was appropriate or whether we needed to make adjustments and tweak the formula and that sort of thing. And there are lots of ways to adjust it. For example, we could have them give the injection more frequently, right, more than, like say, once a week, but then go to twice a week, maybe even three times a week. Uh, or we could have them, uh, in ragweed season, draw off the regular mix and then supplement it with just a tiny amount of ragweed pollen alone. So there are lots of ways to adjust and we would train. Depending on the individual. Well, and, and pretty individual. much anybody who accepted a referral to see us was that interested that they would do those things. Once in a while we would find somebody that wouldn't do injecting, but then they would take the materials to their veterinarian at home and they would do the mixing and the injecting there. Right. But because of some, you know, the worst of the year is up to three times a week, many people decided that that just, they, I can't go to the veterinarian three times a week. And they would do it themselves. Now, one of the, the neatest things of all this is that Kathy Nimmer, the, the blind teacher, had a marvelous golden retriever called Raffles. And Raffles uh, was so cooperative and so docile for everything. And Kathy is a very independent sort of person and wanted to do the injections herself. And so I trained her to do the injecting. Raff, she grabbed it, or she'd lay down, she'd pick up the skin as a tent, put the needle in, put the needle in, and then give the injection. She couldn't do the mixing though, could she? No, oh, no. Okay. What happened is every month I would make her a batch, take it to her house, check Raffles, make sure he's okay, and then she would she go from it, there. Right. So she did do the injections herself. Uh, and if things, with all those clients, if things weren't working well, well then what we did is uh, uh, just make changes until they were working properly. Right. And then this would be a lifetime thing. I, I still have one, well, I have two actually patients who are now very elderly that I still provide the materials to but they're like 16, 17, 18 years old. So right. I know from those experiences that that they can handle the treatment with no sure. difficulty for years. There really isn't any cure for some of these allergies. Is As there? of now, there is not oh. a cure for allergies. And even humans still, have a lot of allergies. Well, they, they do. But you know, one of the really important things is aside from all this, the shots are a, a minor part, but the key is reducing the, the provocation as much as you can. So, for example, if the people had feather pillows in the house, just getting rid of the feather pillows, it brings the total provocation down. And if when they go outdoors, and then they come back in, you wipe them down so you get rid of the pollen sticking to them, that brings the provocation down. Uh, if you limit time outdoors during various parts of the year, that brings the provocation down. In the wintertime, having the house humidified brings the provocation down because house dust isn't quite so flyy. Sure. So there are lots of things you can do to get the provocation down near or below threshold. And so we would train the clients through all those things. And my videotapes and my publications and brochures and things were heavily oriented to educating people as to how they could manage all this stuff. And be aware of some of the changes that might occur and have, you can allow for that. Right. And we can, you, can, you can adjust the medication or what's your the treatment depending on the time or, or the reaction of the, anim or the uh, an animal. Exactly right. Yeah. So now the, the buzzword is evidence-based medicine, but actually you can go back several years and look at those records that people made every day that's evidence-based because that's how we based our treatment. Is on Did you get a lot of referrals from the state? Uh, for we got referrals teacher? from all over Indiana, from southern Michigan, from Chicago, a good bit of Illinois, Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about that, um, the, the slide bank. The, the slide bank. Yeah. Okay. Over the years... Because uh, that sort of follows a little bit with, with the allergies. It, well, it does sure. very much so. Over right. the years, uh, I had been 
collecting pictures of skin disorders in animals of all sorts. Uh, and there are now some 6,000 pictures. And so I started uh, a slide bank to make these available to, to people and to encourage my um, colleagues to contribute to those. And we ran afoul of technology because I spent all my resources and time on making video discs. And so there's some wonderful video discs around that nobody can use. So I'm painstakingly now digitizing all those pictures. So the slide bank exists, but it's very difficult to use until I get finished digitizing. Digitizing. Yeah, understand. And that's slow, tedious work. I would think it would be. Because yeah. those are huge files, and and by the time those you edit discs, each, yeah, right. and you yeah. edit each photo, mm -hmm. yeah. So, but anyway, that was the the idea uh, for the slide bank, and it was very exciting. People were very interested in it, but we ran afoul of technology. Uh, is it still? Are you still con being? Is it still being kept up? Yes, I'm still okay. working on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any other similar? Uh, any other no, facility? No. You're the only one. No, that's it. That's for veterinary medicine. That is, that's what there is. And you're keeping it current. Well, no, it's oh. not current because okay. until I catch up, oh. I'm not wanting to get more stuff right. together. Okay. 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 Right. It would be easy now with digital. Sure. But uh, right now, it's not active except for my work digitizing. Right, which is <laughs> a real challenge. I'm going to stop for a second and ask. Certainly. ask